Hey Sopranos fans, welcome to another episode here on Bully Whispers, and we are here today to evaluate Law 23 of Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power, Concentrate Your Forces, in the TV show The Sopranos. Now this is a chapter that could have been divided into two parts, with the other being titled Focus Your Attention, which makes sense since, as Greene points out, there are many distractions in the world, and it's hard to focus on one thing without being pulled in a thousand other directions. This is definitely a problem that Tony faced, maybe not as much as Christopher, but no matter how the chapter is divided or named, its main focus, especially in terms of this episode, is on three things. The power of a tight-knit community or organization, which is more applicable to the mob in general, the dangers of expanding too far or too fast, and the advantages of having a deep mind versus scattered operations. So, in this episode, we will evaluate Law 23 in The Sopranos by first taking a second to look at the strength inherent in a tight-knit community or group, as shown through the mob, before digging into the dangers of expansion and the power of focused attention, as shown on a couple levels through Tony, his gold mine, which would be garbage slash sanitation, and the related conflicts with Richie Aprile, then ending with everyone's favorite example of what not to do, Jackie April Jr., who attempted to utilize Law 23 but failed, which brings us to a rather surprising comparison between him and a very infamous historical figure. When explaining the power of being tight-knit, Green uses the Rothschild family as a reference point. The Rothschild family had humble beginnings in the Jewish ghetto in Frankfurt, where harsh laws made it practically impossible to mingle outside of the ghetto, but they turned it into a virtue. It made them self-reliant and zealous to preserve their culture. Their first step was to ally themselves with one powerful family and become their sole bankers, rather than seeking many clients, which will come into play later. Next, they didn't trust outsiders and only used their children and close relatives. And lastly, their patriarch didn't name a singular heir. Rather, he set up all of his sons to continue united in an effort to prevent diffusion and infiltration from outsiders. It worked. The sons spread out over Europe and grew to unimaginable levels, all while preventing infiltration from outsiders. Of course, like with the Habsburgs, they ended up taking it to a point that led to some inbreeding. And what kind of a man bangs his second cousin? What are you, the freaking cardinal? But that's a different conversation. Quick side note and hint, the infamous historical figure that parallels Jackie Jr. actually was a cardinal, but we will get to that comparison towards the end. Anyways, up until the inbreeding, it's easy to see how the mob utilized these strategies, especially those regarding their self-contained and distrustful nature, in their rise to power. But this is only part of the reason behind the idea of concentrating your forces. The other aspect deals with the dangers inherent in expanding. When expanding, for every new front you open up, you leave yourself more vulnerable in another, similar to how the war with New York increased both Tony's likelihood for, and vulnerability to, an attack from within his own family. Accordingly, Green notes, it's practically a law of nature that something that expands to ridiculous proportions will inevitably collapse, like ancient Athens, the Roman Empire, and perhaps even the mob itself. They make too many enemies on their path to becoming too big to be ignored or tolerated. It's for this reason Green recommends to concentrate on one single goal, one single task, You're supposed to push with best things, and then beat it into submission. Okay, so maybe old drink water and the jizz took it a bit too far here, but it does set us up nicely for the next area we're going to look into, the advantages of having a deep mind versus scattered operations, where we run into the conflict between Tony and Richie over garbage, in which Richie also provides a great example of the dangers of expansion without focus, as well as running into Christopher and Polly along the way. Now obviously, neither Wobistics nor boiler rooms were going to be a deep mind. Tony's deep mind was garbage and sanitation. This is what he and his crew focused on, and did well enough in before the series began for him to be in such a nice house. This is also probably what allowed him to continue rising so quickly up the ladder even after his father's death. One deep mind. Contrast this with someone like Polly Walnuts, who's been around longer, but doesn't seem to control any big rackets like the Sopranos or Apriles, rather just his own personal scattered rackets. Pull your fucking book against millions gonna roll in off the Esplanade. I figured you'd take it, side. And you can begin to see how one deep mind is better than a bunch of small ones. Taking it further down the ladder, when Polly gives Christopher the gambling operation, which would be a decent sized mine for someone on Christopher's level, had Chris mined it properly, money wouldn't have been a problem, but he didn't. So he had to resort to scattered operations, which only increases chaos and decreases productivity. Now, given that garbage is Tony's deep mine, 
He is understandably concerned when Richie decides to expand his drug business by selling coke along the garbage routes, which is short-sighted, but not without focus. He has a focus, selling his coke. What is expanding without focus in regards to Richie and the garbage business is his fighting with Tony about having the fewest roots in the association. You got the smallest amount of roots of anybody in the association. You know, you're like the old woman who's got a Virginia ham under her arm and she goes around crying because she's got no bread. Never mind. The point is, your brother Jack, he never concentrated on sanitation, so what do you want them to do? Granted, it's normal for those kinds of guys to try to get every penny from anywhere they can, but Tony's answer says it all. Richie's brother Jackie never focused on that area, so he couldn't leave him much in that regard, but it's not like he left Richie with chichi beans. Tony was right. Richie had a Virginia ham under his arm. His brother Jackie did focus on construction, which is acknowledged to be the most profitable racket, and as a result, the Aprio crew did run construction in North Jersey, but Richie doesn't seem to do much with it as far as we can tell. Instead of focusing on construction where he is the strongest, which also happens to be the best place to be strong, Richie decides to open up a new front in garbage where he is the weakest against a superior opponent in Tony in the area that Tony is the strongest. The resulting rage prompted Richie to attempt to start a coup, which caused Tony to give the order to kill Richie, but of course Janice beat him to it. Now, it could be argued that Richie always intended to take Tony out and was just using this as the reason, but I wouldn't exactly agree. I do think that an attempted coup by Richie was inevitable, but I don't really think that was his intention right out of the gate. Either way, had he focused on construction instead of being so distracted by the glitz and glamour of the garbage industry that he was willing to pick a fight to gain a piece, he could have become the highest earning and most influential capo in the family, which would have put him in prime position to make a move as soon as Tony was vulnerable. Quick side note before moving on, of course I have to mention that one of the main reasons that garbage is Tony's bread and butter is due to the legitimate income it provides him, which allows him to do things like buy a nice house without scrutiny, a problem that the more scattered Richie will run into quickly when trying to explain how he afforded his mini-mansion on a fish market salary. Anyways, the other reason to seek a deep mind in terms of allying with people is that power itself exists in concentrated forms, so attaching yourself closely to one very powerful person is often the best way to get ahead, which brings us to Jackie Jr. Whether consciously or not, Jackie Jr. tried to do just that during his attempted rise up the ladder, but always seemed to pick the wrong guy. First, Jackie Jr. tried it with his uncle Richie, but Richie died shortly thereafter, a theme which will appear again in a moment. Then he tried with Ralphie, who ended up being the one to okay his murder, and even though there may have been some subtle pressure by Tony influencing that decision, it's hard to believe that Richie wouldn't have put up a huge fight to keep Jackie Jr. alive if he had been in that situation. Either way, the question that brings us to now is, why did Jackie Jr. think it would be okay to rob Ralphie's card game? Obviously, they were somewhat inspired by the story of how his father and Tony robbed Feech Lamana's card game when they were younger, but the real reason? You know it's going to get squashed. My old man was Jackie Aprio. Brings us to the reversal of the law and the comparison between Jackie Jr. and the notorious Cesare Borgia. How many people thought I was about to say B.I.G.? Cesare Borgia was the son of Rodrigo de Borgia, also known as Pope Alexander VI, and was quite ambitious, but while his father was a very socially and politically astute individual, he leaned more towards the beat em up and take it side. He was able to operate with a much higher level of impunity than most because he was the Pope's son, but then the Pope died. He did manage to gain the favor of an up-and-coming power who became the next Pope, but they died 26 days into their papacy. It was all downhill from there for Cesare Borgia, and he was killed not long after. Just like Cesare Borgia, Jackie Jr. relied on his father, or in his case the memory of his father, which is way less effective, far too much. And when that singular source of legitimacy ran out... For my dad, if not for me. Well, it's been dead two years. As a matter of fact, the expiration date was last week. I know you're bullshit with that. He was done. Quick question for everyone before we wrap this episode up. If Jackie Sr. had still been alive and supportive of Jackie Jr.'s attempted rise, how well do you think Jackie Jr. would have done, and how much do you think he could have gotten away with? Well, thanks for watching this episode here on Bully Whispers. As always, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you at the next score.